again. Welcome back to Drilling Deeper, a Pit and Quarry podcast. I'm the magazine's Kevin Yannick. Got with us once again, Jack Kapansky, our managing editor. Jack, what's going on today? Kevin, I'm always excited to hop into the corner conference room and talk a little aggregates with you. Got a great episode, talking a little dredging. Kind of turned into my wheelhouse inadvertently on the magazine, so that's exciting. Good interview you had with Tracy Sleth of LJ Inc. Looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, we got about 30 minutes with, with Tracy. We talked about his his history and background and, and dredging and, and what the future looks like, and we're going to dig into that in a bit. But first, a word from our sponsor. Can't forget those sponsors. That's right. Thank you first to the sponsor of our show, TCI Manufacturing. Celebrating 25 years of excellence in 2025, TCI Manufacturing embodies the promise of concepts to reality as the industry's leading aggregate resource. TCI specializes in precision-engineered, custom-fabricated steel products committed to delivering top quality, strength, and precision in every project. Learn more at www.tcimfg.com. Thank you also to the sponsor of this episode, Cintron Material Handling. With more than 140 years of bulk material handling experience, Cintron Material Handling is a recognized industry leader that provides innovative engineering solutions, high-performance products, and superior customer service. Cintron offers solutions in conveying, feeding, screening, elevating, vibratory flow aids, and mining controls of bulk product. For more information, visit CintronMH.com. Thank you to TCI and Cintron. Yeah, we appreciate that. 23 in now. And uh, as Jack mentioned at the top, we've got Tracy Sleth today. Did a guest interview with him, I guess it was midway through August, and talking about dredging. Kind of came to our attention, you know, who Tracy was as it relates to dredging. Because LJ Inc., his company to which he's vice president, you know, made some news when they acquired Supreme Manufacturing, which has been a good partner of of Pitt and Quarry Magazine for for a number of years. And, and, uh, you know, Tracy kind of outlined his history with us in, in dredges. You know, he's got some family history related to the aggregate industry. And, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of dredging manufacturing companies out there. Um, you know, Supreme's one of them, obviously. And, you know, LJ, you know, and them, you know, they're working together. You know, Supreme obviously was, you know, headed by Neil Hubler, um, you know, the longtime president of the company. And, you know, so there's some big vision there from from Tracy in terms of technology and, you know, what AI and what automation can do from for dredges um, and bigger opportunities to for what dredges can do uh, potentially in some sites that that aren't already being utilized with a dredge. So, um, Jack, I know you mentioned you're the resident dredge <laughs> guy at Pitt and Quarry. I think when you started your career here, that was probably one of the first or second assignments I gave you. And then I think all the dredge content that we needed to dredge up for the magazine That's right. was put on your desk. But but uh, anything you want to add it before we introduce Tracy formally here? Yeah, no. Um, obviously, uh, a, a big move seeing a company like Supreme get acquired is. Uh, you know, certainly, certainly going to move the needle in our industry when, like you said, there's so few dredge manufacturers because it's such a large undertaking, um, and and Supreme is kind of unique um, in a sense where you know they're they're one of the f- uh, of the few dredge manufacturers. They're one of the few that does buckets and clamshells as a way to, you know, dredge material. So um, certainly an exciting an exciting development. And you know, one thing you're going to hear at the top of this interview, Tracy mentioned that I, I think was. I'm always kind of interested in stuff like this whenever there's uh, a merger and acquisition taking part like this is that he mentioned, you know, that LJ was getting ready to build a facility to, to, to build some dredges and then they end up linking up with Supreme and it kind of was two birds, one stone. They, they get their facilities, they're able to, you know, work with work with what Supreme has to offer and, and kind of go from there. So, and then, yeah, just like you said, I know we've talked ad nauseum about automation on this show and I know as a company here in North Coast Media, we've been doing a lot with AI particularly. Um, so it's always interesting to see different ways that parts of the industry can add on or develop this AI and automation technology to serve themselves better. And, and I also like that he kind of mentioned, he's like, my goal is not to get rid of people. Like, you know, so let's sort of, let's make that clear, which I think can be a lot of people's concern. So I'm excited to see what the future holds for Supreme and LJ. And, uh, yeah, it was a good conversation you had with Tracy. So let's, let's talk dredging. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. We saw the need, you know, we, we saw the need of for, the dredging to be able to take over the future of things because of the, the it's so hard to get the property. It's so hard to get the uh, mining permits. And so you've got to capitalize on everything that's there. And so I see the need for the future for the dredging. And so we bought an old dredge and we tore it completely down and we refurbished it. And 
um you know we have an a automation background you know my my thing is we're trying to build pits that are autonomous and plants that are totally autonomous because the the manpower isn't there the people don't really want to work and so they want to work at a different pace you know so you know that's fine you know we'll take whatever we can get so if these plants can run you know on man and then have people to help troubleshoot them and you know support them and then you have people they still need to grease it and clean it up and do the maintenance so it's not going to replace people altogether but it's just going to give you the ability to capitalize on your investments so anyways we bought the we bought this old dredge and we we were doing our r d and right now it's uh it's running semi-autonomous we're not quite 100 percent completed with it um, not quite ready to take it to market, but you know, we're very close. And, uh, so with that being said, you know, we were getting ready to build a facility to start manufacturing dredges. And then Neil happened to see the article and reached out. And, uh, so it was a perfect match for what we're trying to accomplish. You know, Supreme is like, makes a superior dredge, a Supreme dredge. And it's, uh, you know, why do I need to start from scratch? It's a perfect fit. Tracy, how did you guys identify dredging as an opportunity to begin with? Yeah, you know, I know LJ, just going off the website, it seems like you guys are somewhat diversified into some other markets. And now my impression is you guys are going to go more full steam into mining and aggregates and, and dredging. Um, but I guess what's the history of LJ Incorporated? And then when did you guys identify dredging as an area that you wanted to explore? And it sounds like it's a personal interest of yours too yes so i uh kind of backstory is my my dad was a maintenance man at a gravel pit and so um and we do some you know do a little farming and then i i uh worked for a farmer down the road that was a service manager for simplicity engineering simplicity screens and so he taught me on the machining side of things and you know how to troubleshoot machines you know the shakers and different uh um, screens and feeders and you know whatever different items there in the pit and then my with my dad's technology that your knowledge that he taught me on the mechanical side of things and then I went to school to Michigan State to be for electrical technology so I took on the electrical side of things and, and then I learned the automation and so I have the knowledge of the mechanical side I understand the, mecha the, the machining side of things and then by learning the electricity, you know, learning the electrical technology, you know, by putting that all together, that's how we was able to go after, you know, the aggregate side of the world. I've been doing electrical since 97 in mining industries, you know, must mining pits and the ag world. Um, so I've been in it all my life. I've been working on dredges. Uh, I would say shortly thereafter, about 99, I think is when I, 98 is when we, I got on my first dredge. And so I, they always fascinate me. Anything that's, uh, you know, moving parts, I'm like a big kid, right? I always enjoy any, anything that's moving parts and understanding how it works and how, you know, things that I can try to do to try to make it more efficient. You know, it's, my, my mind really enjoys trying to figure out how to make things more efficient. Um, and so I look at the automation side of things, you know, since I was, uh, I, I used to write code, I still do a little bit, not very much. And so I did the automation on a lot of different things. And so we were working on ways to improve the efficiencies on these dredges. And then, you know, I, I, uh, I see the, the amount of downtime that any plant, anything works with, with personnel on it. And so I was trying to figure out ways to make it more efficient. Um, you know, there's a lot of great people. You know, it's it's hard to replace an operator because a good operator is very challenging to replace. They can hear things, they can feel things, and they they know hey, there's an issue. So you know, with that being said, it's hard to replace people. But you know, so we're using the technology. We're trying to use AI for the you know for things to try to learn and be better and make things more you know durable and resilient to you know longevity on different things and make it more efficient so what are you guys using ai for at this point on on dredging and then you mentioned you know autonomy 
early on during the visit here, Tracy. You know, we see autonomous haul trucks in big mining operations, and we see aggregates now, you know, doing their own little R&D projects. Not little, but, I mean, those are big projects um, on autonomous haulers. Like, what does an autonomous dredge mean in 2024? And then, I guess, where is autonomy and AI going to take dredging in the coming years? Do you have a vision of that? So right now we currently our dredge that we are currently doing our R and D on, it uh, right now it starts up at five o'clock in the morning with no operator and it runs until midnight and shuts down with no operator. Um, I do have an operator that oversees it. You know, it's, it gets he gets notified if there's some kind of problem, and then he does go out and grease things and make sure the belts are tracked and you know just help clean up and over he oversees everything on it. Um, so it, it it does move, you know, that's part of our, you know, things that we're trying to tweak a little bit better, better that it moves on its own. So basically you can, you can have a, the coordinates of the pond that you want to dig that you can potentially put into the system and say, this is what I need to accomplish. And, and this thing will dig it according to, you know, the parameters that are put in the system for it. And so everything will move, it'll adjust the conveyors and and it'll constantly move and dig and to meet the expectations that you're trying to set forth with an on man situation. It's safer. You keep the people away from the moving parts. You try to keep people away from the 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 dirty environment, the noisy environment. So with the with the hearing program and the silicone silicosis program and all those things, you know, just trying to get people removed from from those environments and keep them back in a you know a cleaner environment and for the technology that's out there it's you just got to train them differently so basically you guys are running that thing 19 hours a day um where are the where are the roadblocks i guess i mean to, in terms of actual operation it's, from the sound of it it seems like you could just turn it on somebody oversees it almost like with crushing and screening i mean um if there's some sort of issue the, that's when the operator steps in is it similar to that so for example like uh right now it c runs all day by itself um if you get into certain material clay for example um if, you know it'll plug up shoots so we have tilt switches to identify that you know hey a shoot's plugged up so that's when the operator will have to go and flush the system out and clear the debris that's uh plugged up a you know whatever section that needs to be taken care of, um, you know, or if a crusher chute gets plugged up or, you know, there's different things to be able to monitor, you know, if a cylinder, you know, because it's still mechanical, so you still have mechanical failures. Um, so if there's some kind of mechanical failure that'll notify you that, hey, there's some kind of failure, he can pull it up on his camera, see if it's something that it can reset and then it'll clear it and be able to run it. Or if it's something where he has to go on site and fix the problem. So really, it's taking what used to be like a multi-manned operation. It's kind of limiting it to one person. I imagine that person is kind of doing other things or more more important things, better use of that person's time, you know, rather than just kind of monitoring the dredge yep. as it's going, huh? Yep. So essentially, uh, we're working with a, another facility to make a, a plant autonomous to some semi-autonomous, where it'll start, it'll run, it'll run its surge pile out throughout the day. And then, you know, it's, uh, you know, if the pile runs empty or if it runs out of, you know, it's set times, it'll automatically shut down. And so what the goal is essentially is you'll have one command center. My vision is you'll have one command center where everything is starting and running, but you can monitor this. It doesn't have to be on site. It can be a remote site, but uh, you can have somebody that can still monitor everything, make sure everything's within, within checks. Um, the automation side of it basically tells you, gives you notifications that your amp draws off, your speeds off, um, that there's some kind of mechanical failure that potentially is causing something to be out of out of spec, and that's where the t AI technology is really key because you know it knows the patterns that is typical and that it should be what it should be running at, and so once you know that I that those patterns, if something's out of out of that that scope of where it should be it's going to send a notification saying hey you know this is it's still working however you might have a bearing failing a uh, scraper might be out of adjustment a gearbox might be failing you know there's some you know it'll give you a, a list of things that 
a person on site that can potentially go check it out. So like if you say, for example, if this runs all day long um, and you have a night uh, maintenance, so when the plant shut down, they can go in at night and double check the bearings or, you know, do whatever needs to be checked out at that time. Is that the ultimate goal then? Like to get through that, that 19 hour period, you know, somebody comes in overnight maintenance, they're addressing any bugs or alerts that came up and then you just continue on next day, continuous production. Yep. So whenever they're down, they'll be able to take that maintenance period that they are down and the maintenance people should be able to, you know, critique anything that needs to be critiqued, you know, changing bearings, making sure that it's greased or whatever, and let these plants and dredges run 100%, you know, and try to maximize the efficiency of it and the, up, the amount of uptime, the production time that it can be produced. Yeah, you kind of stole the word out of my mouth for the, my next question, but in your experience here with this R&D project, how much more efficient would you say, you know, a dredge operating this way is versus like the older, more traditional manned operation style? Oh, it's uh it's an easy 30% increase. Easy 30%. Okay. Now you get certain operators that are that are really hard to replace because they, they care about their job, they they put in the time and they get right on it. But Still, it doesn't matter. Like if you have an operator that starts at five, by the time they get checked in and do everything, they still can't start that product up at five. You know, now this is, you know, I, you know, we're working with them, Shaw, and the pre-trips and stuff like that, because now it's, it starts right at five o'clock. As soon as that time, the ordinance says, hey, I can start, you know, it fires up. It doesn't have to wait for somebody to get punched in. It doesn't have to wait for somebody to get up, go out there. It doesn't have to wait for any of that. You know, there's, um, there's, you know, alarms that are still sounding and lights to allow people know that, hey, certain things are happening. Like if it's in a, uh, um, if it can be locked, if it's locked out, it'll let you know, hey, something's locked out, you know, or something's, it's not ready to go for whatever reason. It gives you a notification light so somebody can check at it and be like, oh, okay, this is what's going on. I wanted to ask too, so say, you know, in a typical day, I mean, how often would an alert surface that would require, you know, a stoppage during the ideal production time. I mean, is that a daily occurrence where that happens? Or I guess it all depends on the site. It does. Into, but... So, for example, for hours, we can run days with no notifications. I mean, it just runs with no problems. And then, like, if we get into clay, you know, it could be every couple hours you're getting something where the clay is plugging something up. And some of this is, you know, this is an old design. We took an old, old unit and, you know, we're trying to, we, we were going to, you know, engineer our own, but now with, with Supreme coming into the picture, you know, we're looking at things where we're, we want to basically potentially sell the unit we have and put a Supreme one in there and put our automation on that. And cause it's, it's a better product than what we already currently have, but our automation to, to stick on that. I think is going to be superior and really, I, I think really going to take over in the market once we get everything, all of our R and D totally, you know, redefined and, you know, re, you know, get all the bugs worked out of it. And... When we were offline, you know, before we recording the interview here, you know, you talk, you're talking about mine permitting a little bit and, you know, I kind of identify with some of the things you were talking about in terms of the, you know, the challenge to get sites up and running, get them operational. Um, you know, I shared some of the history, too about how it, it's harder to to uh, like we we haven't seen mines fully be be uh, be, be mined out in certain cases. So we're seeing more historically mined properties, uh, more interest in that at this point. So from that, you know, from your vantage point, it sounds like there's more opportunity to do more dredging. Um, these are some of the limitations and restrictions that we might have with with you know mine permitting. Um, Maybe from that that vantage point, what does the future entail for for dredging? You know, whether it's with, whether it's newer sites or old existing sites that we can get more use out of. I guess what what does dredging uh, dredging's future look like? So there's a there's a huge opportunity. You know, we were talked we've talked to the people in the Florida market um, about going back and you know pre drill you know drilling existing mines that are that are already flooded of uh, working, you know, which they were in the talks before, 
and so it kind of died off, but I think it's something that's going to resurface here of, you know, putting a uh, drill unit on a barge and be able to pre-drill everything and then re-blast the, the limestone and then come back with the dredge and be able to mine all this material. Because currently they've only went down to like 40 feet and those reserves go down to like 140 feet. So there's additional roughly 100 foot of material there that can be captured. And, you know, there's that's millions and millions of dollars that are sitting there. And the same thing with the sand and gravel. Granted, you wouldn't have to worry about blasting, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, quarries in there that been only ran with a drag line or a drag scraper that are only been mined down to 40 feet. And there's potentially hundreds of feet that left there that can be still mined. Tracy, do you see that trend already kind of taking shape where in certain states, certain regions, it's just harder to get a brand new site up and running in an ideal territory where there's demand for for materials and so do you see more people turning to these older sites and you're talking like if you're talking about you know tens or hundreds of feet in in some cases i mean there's a lot more life in that mine i mean it may arguably be more valuable than a brand new mine site yeah so we've already seen several mines that were that were basically closed up because what they used to do is they just used to mine the veins they'd come in and mine that gravel vein and then leave the rest. So we've already seen several mines that we they've been sold and bought by a new owner, which is going back in to mine the entire site. Now, some of the gravies have already been taken, but there's so much good material still there. And then they didn't even really capture the stuff under the water. They only did, you know, small little holes here and there of wherever that gravel vein was, and, you know, and so there's still a ton of opportunity there. And, you know, with the dredge, it's really key because it's easier to blend, you know, that product underwater. And when you get into these different veins, you know, that material will flow as you're digging. And so it allows you to blend that with the dredge already versus if you're mining a high wall and you might have something that's coarse over here and something that's sandier over here. Now you've got to try to blend that on top of the ground where when you're mining it in the water, you're pre -blend, pre blending that. And so we're already starting to see a lot of traction on those type of sites. Are there opportunities too, Tracy, with some sites where say, you know, the original operator, you know, mine the best material and, you know, left like the less ideal stuff. But I guess my question, because of technology, because of our ability, you know, to blend or process in different ways now, can we make better use out of less ideal mater material today because of equipment and technology? Yep. So that's that's been uh, something that we're currently working with a couple sites right now because they're having problems where it's a little uh, finer sand than they prefer, and so it's we're trying to help come up with solutions to be able to you know figure out how we can get the coarser sand to it and what we can do to cut that some of that sand, and so you know with the with the dredge side of it, it's been it's been really beneficial because we can de sand some of that right off the get to help get that coarser sand to what they need. And so they don't even have to send it to, to the plant to be able to process it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about the, the spring manufacturing LJ incorporated deal. Um, that just was announced. Geez, within the last month, I guess we're sitting in, in August, maybe it was within the last two months, Tracy, but, um, you know, you mentioned the article already. I guess what what did you guys discover about each other as you're going through the kind of the, the courting process, and and uh, I guess what does the future hold potentially for for Supreme Manufacturing? I mean, you're talking about a lot of technology. It sounds like maybe that's the direction that Supreme Manufacturing will go. You know, Supreme they already had a pretty decent automation set up on it. You know, we're just trying to take it to the next level to capitalize on you know gaining more efficiencies, better timing more, you know, more product off from it. So be able to take that, the dredging side of it. So my, my, my goal and my vision is to be able to incorporate everything into one setup. So your dredge will automatically feed your plant, the plant, the plant will process it. And then you can have automatic bend set up there. So, you know, you can preload, it'll be preloaded. So when trucks come, they can, they can scan in, they can pull right to the bend. It'll automatically load them for whatever tonnage they want and they roll out. So it can, the, my vision is where you're not going to replace people, but you're going to be able to 
reduce the amount of people that are there to, and have the automation run it to the most efficient way that is possible. Tracy, would you say now like this inflection point with what we can do and the things that we're going to learn in the years to come that we can do with technology? I mean, is that going to be the biggest change that you experience in your career in terms of the production of aggregates? So the technology, I think, is key for everything on aggregates. It's 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 defining and how we process it. It's defining and how, how you know different ways we can try to make it and the different ways we can blend it. You know, you look at how how concrete and asphalt is made was made, and to look at all the different ways you know the different splits that they're putting into it, the different types of stone, the different sands. You know, they use a ton of manufactured sand, and at least in our areas, different areas are different. But, uh, you know, the technology just keeps evolving to try to make a better product. And I think, you know, you, you, you need to use that technology from the from the very beginning. So as soon as you're starting to take it out of the ground to all the way across, you're seeing more automated scales. You know, you're seeing everything more and more goes to the automation side of things. Yeah. And, that that's still that's the future I see with everything is you got to use this automation to your advantage and you're gonna to be competitive in this world you've got to use that automation to be the most competitive that you can possibly be. Tracy, the magazine. I mean, you're hitting on a subject that we talk about all the time. You know, people. You know, versus technology. Um, I mean, it seems, sounds like you have a very optimistic long term view on what equipment and technology can do to better operations to make them more efficient. Yeah, you know, I think people the last few years as we've had conversations about the challenge, the labor challenge, um, we maybe haven't necessarily seen what the like, you know, what the future is fully gonna look like. But based on what you're telling me, it seems like there's gonna be tremendous opportunity to to fully automate, you know, to use AI to the advantage of of, you know, various companies and operations. You know, and if you look back historically at our at our industry, I mean, you're talking about some sites that, you know, had 50, 60, 100, 100 plus people, you know, in a mine site, you know, 50 to 100 years ago. And, you know, now we're whittling them down to one or maybe two people who are just doing different sorts of things. So, um, so maybe just to put a question to it, are you pretty optimistic and excited? It sounds like excited, too, about, about what the future of mining, what the future of aggregates looks like and how it's going to be impacted by technology. Absolutely. Well, you look at like, for example, even cat, you know, they're taking a, their operator and taking it out of the machine and just sticking them in an office. And so they're not even, you know, on the machine anymore. They're running it like a video game because the technology and just the way the, the generations growing up, you know, they're, they're, they're done everything off from computer and video games. So, you know, that's what they're used to. And so be able to run a piece of equipment, you know, on a video essentially like a video game that's what they're that's what they're used to and so you know putting them in the in the field it's hard to find people that that want to be able to be in the field um you know it's just it's a different culture than we're ever used to and you, you've got to adapt to what that culture is because uh you're not gonna you're not gonna get that culture to go you know they, if they don't want to be dirty they're not going to get dirty they're going to either not work or they're going to find something else that does. So, you know, if you can adapt to what they're, what they want to do, that's your workforce. And so that's, that's what you have to do. You've got to be able to adapt to the needs that are out there. Yeah. You made a comment earlier too, and you're touching on it again now, but you know, if a producer doesn't adapt, if, if they don't modify their operations to the potential output of what, you're describing here. I mean, how how are they how are they going to compete? I mean, I guess they will, but but it's going to be so less advantageous, I would imagine, if they're you know relying more on on manpower, on, on traditional ways of, of processing. Um, you talked about thirty percent more efficiency. That's kind of what you're already experiencing through some yep. of the things you're trialing. I mean, is that gap potentially going to grow? The more we learn and, and are capable of doing. Yeah, so the initial cost uh, is what scares a lot of people away on automation. But, you know, it's if you pencil it out, it pays itself within two years a lot of times so that automation's paid for. And so 
Yeah, if somebody's looking at it and saying, well, I can do this for this much. Yeah, you can do that for that much and you'd be cheaper for the first year and maybe p cheaper for the second year. But okay, now we're to the third year. Guess what? Now you're you're more money. And so it's trying to get people to be able to look at that bigger picture and see what that truly is going to gain them. Uh, we've done it on some crushers, you know, just to be able to put the automation on these on, on crushers on what they've already seen on the efficiency on just the crushers. And it's gave them, you know, notifications of what things are already starting to go wrong before it actually goes wrong. So it saves them so much money in downtime. It saves them money and, you know, they trying to run the crushers more efficient. Um, and the crusher manufacturers that are out there are recognizing it too. And so they're, uh, they're adding this automation on there as well. So it's, it, it's the future. It's just trying to get more and more people to embrace it and understand that, Hey, you know, it's, Yes, so there is an initial upfront cost, um, and you can piece it in there, but a lot of times people will start to piece it in, and they're like, okay, I'm good. I I put automation on it, and it's like you, you put the first step into it. You, you really need to complete it to see the, the full picture, the, the full savings on it, and the full potential of what it can do for you. What What is the typical customer mindset now when they, you know, you're having a conversation about automation or 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 technology broadly um, is there a willingness to adapt? Is there understanding that if they don't start to move in the more future mindsetting direction that, that they're going to fall behind? I mean, where are we now? I mean, where, where were we a couple of years ago? Cause I would imagine that that we're starting to see more people embrace this, but some laggards too, I would imagine. Yeah. So you're definitely seeing uh, more people starting to embrace it. It's just the initial upfront, you know, you know, preparing their budget to, you know, to handle it. And then, you know, it's, you know, being committed to it. You know, there's a lot of times, you know, there's, there's issues with anything you do initially, they, they might start it. And then there's some issues because they don't fully implement it. And so if you don't ever fully implement it and you have issues, then they like, Oh, it doesn't work. Well, you've got to commit to it. You know, if you want it to be successful, no different than anything in your life. If you want something to be successful, you have to commit to it and put the time and effort to get it across that hump. And so some people are really good about trying to, you know, put that commitment to it and get it across the finish line. And some people will act like they're going to and uh, only do half of it. And it's a good starting point because I do understand it's a, it's a nugget that needs to be, you know, that they don't necessarily, you know, prepare for, but it's something where I think more and more people are being open to it. I know there's a lot of more, a lot more talks on it than what there has been. There's more committees on automation and different things. You know, I, I go back to scales. It seems like more and more people have embraced the auto, you know, the auto scales and there's, you don't see you know, they're all wireless, you know, printers that are printing off the tickets. You don't see the scale clerks anymore like like you used to. There's still a lot of them out there, but there's still a lot of automation out there that's replacing those. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot involved in, in aggregate operations from A to Z, you know, drilling and blasting to getting products loaded out the door. Um, yeah, I guess one by one, we're kind of checking off boxes. You know, you talked about scales as one. Now we're looking at dredging. I mean, pr pretty soon the whole process of mining and processing aggregates is going to be automated arguably yep. so we have a site that uh you know we've done a couple different sites where essentially this whole plant will run and they have an ipad that they stick in their loader or skid steer and they all they do is they go around cleaning up so this entire plant can be is all ran off their iPad and they're in there cleaning up, just taking care of spillages and it lets them know what's going on. So we've already seen the the huge improvement on a lot of these plants where you know you, you would take something where you'd have a you know, somebody running the crush plant, somebody running the the sand plant, somebody run the gravel plant, somebody run the field line, somebody would be running the, the dredge, and now you've already condensed that into one person essentially that's running all those. And then you, then you have your, somebody that's running a loader and you still have those people, but 
you, you've condensed it all the way down to already one or two people. Is the maintenance of plants and equipment, is that kind of the last thing that we'll ever be able to, to address? Um, or, or automate, rather, I guess. That That's not here, but, I mean, do you ever envision the, the maintenance ever being being outsourced to machines, I suppose? It's kind of a out there question, but it seems like that's one of the last, you know, links in the chain. There's uh, the way they're going with that AI and the AI technology. It's definitely possible. Yeah. Never say never, I guess. Never say never. Look at the, the robots and what they're able to accomplish anymore. All right. Well, thanks again to Tracy Sleth for, for joining me. It was great to, to have him, and you could read a little bit more with Tracy in the September edition of Pit and Quarry. He's the featured P&Q profile person. Um, that's toward the back of our, our print edition, the September edition of the magazine. So, you know, Jack, again, as usual with the interviews we put out here on Drilling Deeper, there's kind of a lot to unpack and a lot of areas we could, could take our commentary. But, but uh, I think maybe the thing that stood out to me from Tracy's comments was just the vision for the future and how technology is already in motion to make things a lot more efficient. Uh, you talked about the labor shortage, something we hear about every day, all the time, you know, here at the magazine and within the industry. And, you know, he talked about the opportunity to to automate and you use artificial atel- intelligence at the end of the day to make a dredging operation that much more efficient. And he even put a number to it. He said, you know, from the R&D project they're working on because they've got an old dredge and, and they're doing a lot of, development with it right now and 30 percent more efficiency is what he's discovered is is the gain the potential gain there um it sounds like they're working on a product to unload to the market to unveil to the market and maybe that's coming sooner than later but but uh just a huge opportunity there um to to do things a lot more efficiently at the end of the day and what what did you take away from what we heard from Tracy, Jack. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously a, a large chunk of the conversation, like you mentioned, surrounded automation and artificial intelligence. And as a as a uh, as a gamer myself, I, I kind of liked the part where he jumped in and said, you know, running machines, or they want sort of running the machines to be kind of like a video game, being able to do it remotely, um, and also using it as a problem solver. We mentioned before the episode, or before the interview, and he mentioned it in the interview, that, you know, he's not going to replace people, but you can kind of reduce the amount of people you have there, and, you know, that not only does it make operating easier, but that can also solve where, you know, if a company is experiencing, you know, a hard time finding workers, by incorporating automation in this way, that might sort of solve that problem where you don't need to find those employees anymore while keeping the ones you already have. So that's that's obviously exciting. And, you know, as we've talked about on previous episodes, depending on who you talk to, there can be sort of more willingness or less willingness to take on or sort of be the guinea pig for new technology like this. And, and it was interesting what, what Tracy had to say where he mentioned that people are sort of ready to embrace it, but, you know, obviously with newer technology like this and especially I can only imagine on a on a machine like a dredge the cost is going to scare some people away which is understandable but I think it's still exciting that that people are willing and wanting to do this and you know hopefully as the technology gets a little bit more developed a little more fleshed out the cost maybe comes down a little bit and becomes a little less cost prohibitive um, it'll be exciting to see how this plays out for sure it was awesome the whole concept he was talking about uh, with starting the dredge up at five in the morning ending it at midnight essentially there's one operator who doesn't really get on the dredge unless there's a maintenance need for it like a chute gets plugged up or or some sort of issue that requires a man to actually or a woman to get on that on that piece of equipment the manpower um essentially he was describing too you know working with another customer to who you know has a dredge and you know that operator is just in their skid steer or their loader um cleaning up piles cleaning up messes that the surface at the operation and the iPad or the device, the phone, I suppose, you know, th- that's what's in the cab. That's what they're utilizing. And, you know, they'll get those aler- alerts or hazard notices when there's something they need to hop out of the cab for. Um, I think toward the end too, I even asked Tracy about, you know, maintenance, because it seems like we're getting so close to almost everything running by itself. It's just the little hiccup. It's, it's like when something breaks, it still requires a person to get in there and, and fix that. Um, and he was even joking at the end, that maybe the machines, maybe the robots are going to get us there. Um, I, I think that will probably happen, Jack. I don't know if that's going to happen 
in our lifetime, you know, with dredges or crushers or screens. But um, I feel like right now the focus when we talk about automation and AI is, you know, on the process and just understanding how to source the material from wherever it is to, to get it through the different components that are necessary, you know, whether it's the crusher or the screen, um, you know, the wash plant. But 50 years from now, 100 years from now, you know, we may see drones not only run – autonomously but we may see them fix themselves um i'm not never going to say never I yeah the last phrase i used with uh with tracy during that interview but um yeah a lot to unpack for sure coming out of that right and i think you know it makes me think of the conversations we've had as a as a company again our parent company north coast media doing a lot with ai and i think one of the important things that that has been sort of been conveyed to us is that it's like this can do a lot to replace what we maybe do on a day-to-day basis, but you're always going to need that human element. And that's what this kind of reminds me of where, again, there's there needs to be a human, at, again, at least for now, who knows what's going to happen in the next decades or centuries. But, you know, at least for now, you, you, need, you need a human to start it up. You need a human to shut it off. You need a human to do maintenance and repairs. So, um, you know, anyone out there clamoring or worried that they're going to be out of a job because AI or automation is coming, I think you're safe for now. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna promise anything, but um, yeah, no. I, and I think it's it's a conversation we've had before, where this is a human industry, and I think it's always going to be in some extent. You're never going to be able to take people completely out of a quarry. You're never going to be able to take people completely out of a a dredge operation. So, you know, I, I it at least on paper, you know, it sounds like Tracy and LJ Inc. are really taking a smart approach to this, and um, you know, I'm rooting for them. I, I I hope it's something that is able to you know come to fruition, and we're able to see, you know this play out like they're hoping it will one other piece i'd mentioned coming out of the interview too jack was just the idea of being able to make more efficient use out of the reserves that are out there um i'm pretty sure on drilling deeper in the past you have talked about the concept of maximizing the reserves that were there and you know as a country we we have pits and quarries that were established in every state you know almost in every city i suppose and and uh in a lot of cases especially in the earlier years of this industry you know those sites were abandoned for one reason or another, maybe a business reason or, you know, family generation didn't change often or the company just got lost, you know, mining ceased to exist at certain sites. So, you know, Tracy had mentioned, you know, they're already working with some customers that have reserves or are in some sites that, you know, maybe had 40 feet mined and there's potential to get hundreds more. So maybe the best material has already been mined, but with equipment and technology and our ability to, to make better use of, less ideal material. I mean, there's so much more opportunity to to take existing properties. And this is what he talked about with the mining permits issue and just being able to source land and resources. Um, there's opportunity to resurrect some of the old sites that already went through the, the regulatory hoops that could be more easily resurrected versus going about greenfielding a brand new site, which is costly, timely, expensive. So um, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, when it comes to dredging from just digging deeper to d- doing things a little bit more efficiently, you know, with a dredge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I guess just my last thoughts is you mentioned the, you know, sort of the reserves and the permitting. And that's one of the things that I've learned as I've sort of covered a bit more dredging is that it's like, you know, you, you want to get permitted for, you know, a greenfield quarry, you know, you've obviously, obviously got a lot of hoops and a lot of regulations and things to jump through. It kind of seems like the way it's been explained to me is that, amplify that to the second third degree um when it comes to dredging because you've got obviously water you know you've got the water involved and how you're sort of recycling the water what you know how how deep you can go how close you can go all that stuff so i mean it's you know it it there's a lot that goes into it for sure um but you know that's why that's why they make the big bucks i guess that's right that's right well, again, thanks to Tracy Sleth, LG Inc., for, for getting together and, and sharing the latest on dredging his vision for the future and talking technology with us here on Drilling Deeper. Well, what else can you look for here at the magazine of late? Um, our September edition should be in your mailbox by this point, so check that out. We've got a lot of coverage dedicated to the upcoming Mine Expo show. It's going to be here in another couple of weeks. Pitt & Corey is going to be there. We actually are going to have a booth in the North Hall of the Las Vegas Convention Center, so so come on by, visit us, grab a copy of the September issue. We've got our must-see exhibit supplement within that. And, you know, Jack and I are also planning to do some some interviews for future episodes of Drilling Deeper in the in the booth. Again, that's in the North Hall, booth 216. So check us out out there. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be 
out in Vegas for Mine Expo, you know, reach out to either Jack or I. Our emails are in the description of the the episode here. So, you know, we'd love to connect beforehand and, you know, maybe plan something out with you for, for our future uh, future content so we can share with our with our listeners. That's right. After that, it's uh, focus shifts to Ag1 2025 in St. Louis. That's the next big show nationally. You're right. Crazy to think we're already thinking 2025, man. I feel like 2024 just got here. It sure did. It sure did. Um, well, I think that's going to almost ha- do it for this episode of Drilling Deeper. Jack, I want to give one last shout-out to our sponsor here. Before we go, I want to give one more thanks to our show sponsor, TCI Manufacturing. Celebrating 25 years of excellence in 2025, TCI Manufacturing embodies the promise of concepts to reality as the industry's leading aggregate resource. TCI specializes in precision-engineered, custom-fabricated steel products committed to delivering top quality, strength, and precision in every project. Learn more at www.tcimfg.com. Well, that should do it for episode 23 of Drilling Deeper, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you. See you.